serious one that just came in. There is a women's group in Zimbabwe which has been carrying out developing a very interesting nonviolent uh, resistance. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I don't want to know yet. An, an interesting nonviolent resistance against the Zimbabwean regime, and especially the police, and there's just been recently a very unpleasant arrest, and there's a woman named Jenny Williams who mistreated and sequestered there. And so uh, the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict has sent out an urgent call that would people please, if you can afford it, call Zimbabwe and tell them we're monitoring what's going on there. We want you to release Jenny Williams and uh, generally stop doing that. OK, so in, in a minute, we're going to have that, uh, I hope, we're going to have that machine and we're going to listen to this tape. But in the meantime, let's get started back. I wanted to first finish the sort of grid that I was laying out last time that m you might find helpful as a way of organizing material and might be particularly useful for your papers. Oh, by the way, this is also pertinent to us, though I forgot the room number. I will probably show up at the right room, but this is for our early final. Um, if you think about you know, we talked early on in the semester about how there's a difference between observable behavior and the forces that are actually at, in play in an interaction. And you could look at two people. Oh, I knew they wouldn't be able to resist you, Lara. <laughs> Thank you. So let me just do that and then I'll plug this in. Um, that one of the reasons it's hard to talk about strategic and principled nonviolence is it is not a wissy wig universe. It's not the case that what you see is what you get. You can look at two groups of people and they'd be behaving in the same way, but unless you know how to observe them very closely, they would actually be motivated very differently. And we in the principled nonviolence community believe that it's the motivation and it's the quality of the energy that goes into the system that determines what the outcome is going to be. So that's one of the big diff difficulties. And I kind of spread it out. Here you have people. This is all people who have decided not to use violence, that is to say not to use physical, visible violence in a given situation. What could their reasons be? And you can put them out on a spectrum. I started this because I was reading about a group of people who did not use violence. I don't even remember which group it was because it's not the kind of thing that interests me particularly. And they were asked, why didn't you use violence? They said, we didn't have any guns. So <laughs> this is sort of, it's sort of lame. But I suppose even if you don't have guns, you could try to bite people and <laughs> curse them and things like that. So let's call this a form of no violence going on, but certainly it's, it's been taken out of your hands in terms of human choice and it's, it's not going to really make a big difference from our point of view. But then you could talk about people who chose not to use violence even though it was available to them, but they decided not to because something in them thought that, that would, it would not work. It would backfire. And at this point, we're starting to get closer to our kind of commitment. And the, the line between strategic and principled is a line between uh, – through a group of people who choose not to use nonviolence, but one group is doing it because they don't think it'll work in this situation. That's the big difference. We restructure the situation, give them another chance, they'll go ahead and use it. And this is what Gandhi said about the uh, suffragists, suffragist movement in Britain that, yeah, they're not using violence and we're not using violence. The difference is that they're not using it because they don't think it will work for them. And you give them back a situation where they can use it. They've promised to use it effectively. We have, whereas we have decided never to use it under any circumstances. And of course, later on, we'll build in a little exception about the madman with the sword. But leaving that aside for the time being, we decided not to use it under any circumstances. And that's equivalent to saying we have decided not to use violence on principle. Now, 
when you decide not to use violence on principle and you just rule it out, the world is not going to immediately configure itself into a very sweet, wholesome place where you don't need to defend yourself. You don't need to protect anyone else. And you don't need to do anything about injustice. So I regard this situation, someone who chose not to use violence for a principled reason, as being uh, – what's that term in chemistry where you, you have a state that's very unstable and it transitions to another state? I forget. I'm very bad at chemistry. But you know, you have a chemical that doesn't actually enter into the reaction but it precipitates a reaction happening. This is a catalyst. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Of course, I knew that. It, it's a catalyst. This state is like a catalytic state in that in itself it's not stable. You keep going around just saying, I'm not going to use violence, I'm not going to use violence. Eventually the pressures will build up where you have to use something. And it's at that point where you might choose, what is it that I am going to use? And I've, I've gone on record as decided to use a four-letter word here. I hope maybe it's small enough that some of you can't read it and we won't get into any trouble. But the choice not to use violence is, has, should be a precursor to the choice to use love, the choice to love, to use some positive force. And I have no objection really to any of these positions, but ideally it should progress to that final state and that's the only one that is really stable. That's the only one. Once you figure out what you can do, you can stay there and the rest then just becomes a question of learning the principle well enough that you can apply it in whatever situations you find yourself. So Joy? Well, one of, one of the reasons that I'm spreading things out on charts like this horizontally and vertically is to get away from the yes-no dualistic, is this violence or is it not violence? Now, in the kind of situation you described has two important characteristics from our point of view. One is that it's an emergency. You're not talking about a woman walking around with a bottle just in case she gets attacked. And two, it's a question of self-defense. And I think that becomes a personal issue. And it's a rare individual who can live in the state that they will not use violence to defend themselves even if they're suddenly attacked. There are such individuals, Gandhi was one of them. There are several episodes of him being attacked and never lifting a finger in his own defense. He said his son should have defended him if he was there, but which is interesting. Defending another person is a little bit different from defending yourself. But he wouldn't even defend himself against cobras or anything like that. So I don't think I'd, I would uh, – Elana? So would he defend his son? Sorry? Oh, would he defend his son? Huh. I expect so. Yeah. I mean, if it meant, you know, if he was defending someone else, then it meant, you know, risk. It meant if something it going – acting violent towards the aggressor in defense of someone else. I, I think we're all – all these cases are in the ballpark of the madman with the sword. That they're emergencies and you have to defend someone else. And your only option is to do so through, uh, if, if necessary, lethal force. He went on record as saying that the person who does that will have done the community a favor. And I assume that's equivalent to saying this was not a violent act. But remember we had some criteria for the mental state involved here. This is a good uh, little spot quiz here. How many of these can we, re we remember? Suppose this – 
situation comes up. You find yourself in Oakland or something like that. <laughs> Somebody's attacking someone and you have to intervene with force and it's dangerous. It could even be lethal. You want to come back and tell me that it wasn't violent. What are the criteria? Can you remember those? Amy? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, all of those things would generally be true. They, yes, you have to be detached from the results. Um, but detachment from results has a special twist in this case. Anyone remember? I think the example I used was what if the door burst open and somebody came in here with a submachine gun, special uh, student killer ammunition in it. And I just happen to have a nine millimeter in the drawer here. That just <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the classroom of the future, they'll all have uh, handguns <laughs> for such an emergency. And I, of course, I don't kill that person. That would be real world. What we do is we take them out. <laughs> I take this person out or some other euphemism. And then I want to say that I did it nonviolently. What do I have to be able to say? Rami. Mm, okay, what would my first instinct be? I Shannon? Think, I was just going to say, I think that if you have a gun in your desk, yeah. you're in this kind of situation, there's no it, way you can say it. it. It's already lost situation. It's not an emergency. But let's say, okay, this will satisfy both Rami and Shannon. The person comes in. I'm looking for a ruler so I can go and slap him on the wrist, which is what teachers do. <laughs> and I say, oh my gosh, someone's left a 9 millimeter here and he's about <laughs> to <laughs> – <laughs> have, have, I think we've made the point that this is not a very likely situation to happen. <laughs> and that's good because we're not talking about things that you should anticipate, but theoretically they're of interest. Okay, Sid and then Catherine. Um, because you're worried about a person, right. Not right. It's very important that I don't say, you know, I, I hate people who kill students. Uh, you know, I call them some dehumanizing word like student killers or something like that. And they blam, blam, take that, get you deserved it. Uh, that's one kind of act. And another kind of act is, oh God, why do I have to do this? <laughs> like of course, I would get Camilla by mistake. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. I, I am not motivated by hate. I'm made of motivated by love, but it happens to – come out looking kind of weird in this situation. So that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say like not acting out of anger. You're right. Yeah. I, it's about the same. I'm not acting out of anger. Um, th but there were two others of which the second is kind of interesting and the third is extremely important, almost as important as the first one. Anybody remember them? Uh, yeah. Philip. Well, that is another – that's a very similar case. And I, I think you're right, Philip. It's not totally involved, but it is interesting where someone wrote to him and said, a bully slapped me and I felt humiliated and I didn't hit him back. Wasn't that wonderful? And Gandhi said, frankly, no, you should have hit him back. But then he said, why were you humiliated? That's the problem. It does not humiliate you if another person attacks you. Once you're entangled in it in that way, you've lost it psychologically, that you can only do the next best thing, which is to defend your dignity, which is much more important than the defending your body. <coughs> okay, if the first criterion is I do this not out of anger, the second is that let's say the person uh, sees that I'm about to take him out and he whirls and he wings me, which I think is what you say in Western movies, you know, I've been winged, partner. Uh, I'm not going to go and complain about this. You know, I'm going to bitch him and say, here I was trying to do my duty as a professor and uh, I got shot. It's not fair. So that's not going to be done. I entered into a situation where the best option available to me was one using physical violence. I'm not going to complain if I got hurt. 
But now comes the third criterion, which is probably up there with the first one in importance, and that is remember the non-triumphalism. I am not going to say, <laughs> uh, always, always keep a loaded nine millimeter in every classroom. That'll take care of these varmints. Um, instead, I'm going to say, where have we gone wrong? What kind of society is this that people go, go bananas and pick up guns and try to kill? And there's bananas right there, <laughs> innocent people. Uh, let's not get into a scenario where we're throwing bananas at each other. That would t take us too far afield. But really, uh, because I have used superior force to prevent a use of violence, I am not going to say that the situation was a success. I'm going to say it was the best we could do. It's an indicator that things are very wrong and I now commit myself to fix them so that this doesn't happen again. If I do all of those three things in my mind, especially the first and the third, I'm going to say that this was not really a violent act and if people uh, complain about that, I'll take them back. I'll rewind to the first or second lecture where we were talking about ahimsa, which literally means the absence of the intention to harm. I was not intending to harm even that person. I was intending to stop him or her. Unfortunately, I had no other way of doing it. Shannon? Yeah. Clearly, it would be preferable to do things with a taser than with a bullet. But even there, as you can see, problems develop because then the police get more willing to shoot. And there's been at least one case of someone who was killed with a taser because uh, this thing had delivered a very powerful shock. And, uh, and I think you used the right expression. I'm taking away their choice. So in no way is this going to be an ideal persuasion versus coercion solution. We're talking about emergencies. In emergencies, we don't expect to do something ideal. We expect to do the best we can. Um, I, I think one of the most interesting things is like here is Gandhi who is completely committed to this and he's intensely active for 50 years, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. The situation never arose for him. So it's not likely that it's going to arise. But it does help us understand what we really mean by nonviolence. Rami? How does this um, interplay with the, the movement led by the Jewish leader? Head by? Jewish leader. Oh. Who said, you know, like, or stop attacking me and just stop attacking us. And then they, he viewed it as a kind of like they, that they were being attacked. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think somebody should be able to answer it because there is a. Uh, on this one, there's a very clear answer. How do I stop this uh, example that I just used from becoming an excuse for any group that feels that it's under threat? And there are many such going and arming themselves. Uh, you use the example of the Black Panthers, but <coughs> we could use a thousand groups around the world today. What, what is the difference? Hold on a second, Joe. Let's see if somebody else can. Uh, this is good, uh, good stuff for you to know. Uh, Catherine? Uh, Right. Um, like emergency. Emergency. Yeah. Whereas, like, that was like they actually thought about it before uh -huh. they were arming themselves yes. to go attack the group. The key term which you almost used <laughs> is preparation. The, pr the logic here is this if you have time to prepare violently, then you have time to prepare nonviolently. So you had a choice. Um, 
you know, this is not a good or bad thing, but if you, had a, if you have a chance to prepare, then you have a chance to prepare nonviolence on many different levels. Prepare yourself psychologically, think strategically about how you're going to cope with the potential threats and so forth. As long as you've got a chance to prepare, you can prepare nonviolence. But we're talking about a situation which hopefully will never occur, never occurred to Gandhi, but it's interesting, a situation where there is no time to prepare. You've got to use what's at hand. John? Okay. Let's see if I still give you the same answer today. Well, when people use the term by any means necessary, as they do in the Berkeley group by that name, it usually is a foregone conclusion that the necessary means is a violent one. And my argument all along has been that when you really take a pragmatic look at what the results are, especially if you're willing to look beyond what happens right now to the long-term results, you'll see every single time that nonviolence is much more effective. So you cannot argue that it's necessary to use a means that doesn't work. So in yeah, in strict logic, if you actually believe that you're going to use any means necessary, you obviously would want to use ones that work as opposed to ones that don't work. And if you know what work versus work means, you'll choose nonviolence every time. And once again, we're not even invoking moral or ethical considerations. Yeah. God gave me these teeth and I'm responsible for preserving them, that kind of thing. So I think that that's really the bias of the vote. I mean, the police cannot be morally angry and they can get the benefit of the process by protecting them. Um, you know, it, my experience has been that it's going to be very difficult to make a yes no decision about these different grades. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem to help a whole lot to understand the situation heuristically. Um, I know that there are cases of people who have – and we remember when we were talking about the civil rights movement, we said what gets a person into a state that they can face a really fearful threat and not even try to defend themselves? All I want to say is we know that this is possible for people to do. Nehru describes being in a Lathi charge with people who were coming down, beating them with these clubs. And he said long – he knew instantly that he could pull a policeman down off the horse. And he was a very good polo player. You've probably seen some John Wayne movies too. Um, but he, he said – and his direct – his exact words are, long training and discipline held. And he didn't even lift up a hand to defend himself. And they say that the same was true in that uh, – in the uh, salt pans, the Dharamsala salt pan raids, that most of those 238 people who were hospitalized, they even overcame what we might call the instinctive reaction to raise their hand to defend themselves. So I can't answer the question, you know, is it – is it violent if you <laughs> raise your hand to defend yourself? It's not exactly how I – approach it. I just know that ultimately the human being can reach a state where you don't even do that. And that state seems to have a, a kind of protective power. Though if – this is tricky – if I go into it and I say, I'm not going to raise a hand to defend myself because I know that vulnerability is a better way to defend myself and I definitely don't want to get hurt, I want to preserve my teeth, that doesn't seem to work as well as saying, I'm not going to use physical means no matter what. That seems to be somehow very powerful. This – right away, let's be very clear about this. People get killed. People get hurt. 
doing nonviolence. But they tend to get hurt and killed less often than when they use violence. Here's a, here's a quote. Uh, a handgun is often used to – oh, no, sorry, the wrong quote. <laughs> this is a quote that illustrates something else. <laughs> but uh, it's been calculated, if I remember correctly, that somewhere between a third and a half of homicides are what are called victim-precipitated homicides. The victim pulls out a weapon to defend him or herself and immediately gets blown away. Um, so I guess I'm saying that it becomes a personal matter and, you know, look at the whole spectrum. It's amazing to realize that people can overcome even what we think are very, very basic primal instincts that are hardwired into us and when they do it has a certain kind of power. Next semester, we'll be looking at a film uh, called Where There Is Hatred and in it there's a rather long sequence on the People's Power Uprising in the Philippines and there's a, a priest who discusses that movement there toward the end and he, he said, we figured out how to turn our vulnerability into a form of power. And that's a very interesting concept, the power of vulnerability. I think that rather than saying exactly what you should do in this and such a case is, is about the best I can do by way of approaching it. Okay, now a word from our sponsor. Okay, if we can get this to work, uh, what you're going to hear is going to be a little bit more difficult than seeing a text in writing. But on the other hand, this is very transparently obvious what's going on here. Uh, as you know, this is an ad for a type of device made by a company called Protec. Um, there it is. Play. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I may have to may have to act this out after all. I'm sort of hoping. Oh, this is amazing. That's it's doing that because it's at the end of the tape, right? That's why it's making that noise. <coughs> Try some more time. Hmm. <laughs> well, I'm flummoxed. Does anybody have a notion why this might? Oh, could I have put this in wrong? No, no, that was right. We'll have a terrific time with this next week. <laughs> I'm going to flip it over one more time and try. We might be getting somewhere. It's working. That's <laughs> that all you have to do is get anywhere near it. Yes, dear, we're all fine, but something's happened. What? What happened? Well, you remember the new Protec alarm system you had installed in the house? Well, about an hour ago it went off. It went off? It woke me up and, well, I looked out the window and I saw two strange men jump over the fence. Well, I called the police and they came and they caught them in and they took them away. You poor baby. You, you've had quite a night. Well, we're all okay. I just wanted to tell you. What is it, honey? Thank you for having that Protec alarm system installed. It may have saved our lives. And I love you, honey. Mommy, mommy, let me talk to Dad. Come on, Mom, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> before we rush out and buy a Protec <laughs> device for our house, uh, what are some of the underlying assumptions <laughs> going on here? <laughs> it's almost too ridiculous. <laughs> You couldn't. You could not get away with this today. Anyway, this is obviously was. Uh, yes. 
that the, the two men would have killed them? Yeah, to save their lives. That's mm -hmm. Philip. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, and uh, as we know very well from experiments and from observation, this fortress mentality leads to insecurity, unhappiness, um, and danger, ironically enough. So we turn every house into a fortress, and they're going to call that security. So you know, let's, let's dig around deeper. What are some of the other assumptions? What are some of the things that made us laugh hardest about all of this? Sid? Um, the sexism. Right. The sexism you could cut with a knife. That was fantastic. Yeah. That women are hopeless, hysterical creatures that stay at home that have to be defended. And now here's where it really starts to get interesting. <laughs> Men do not have to stay at home to defend their spouses. Their role is not – to support the family. Their role is to go out and catch antelope. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> raise money. And uh, think about that. I think really the most pernicious line in the whole uh, four minutes or however long that was, the most pernicious thing is the very end. Remember what she says breathlessly? I love you that you earn love from your partner by purchasing a mechanical substitute for yourself. And that this is ultimately – it has to be the thrust of all advertising, that every serious human value is purchasable. And what that leads to – We're not quite through with this stupid ad yet, but there was – ah, what this leads to is rather than emphasizing the character and use of a product, American advertising firms highlight its personality and charms, stressing illumination instead of lighting fixtures, prestige instead of automobiles, sex appeal instead of soap, and so on. In other words, uh, you, what you have to do is convince a person that they're buying these absolutely unpurchasable human qualities when they buy a particular product. And this is, this is one of the main reasons that the economy that we've got leads to absolute disaster. But we're also going to transition very soon into discussing uh, criminal justice. So I want to talk about that part of the ideal scenario here. And the, the two men were strangers. I didn't recognize them. I called the police. The police came and took them away. What's, what are we supposed to m believe about all of that? Uh, yeah, Joy? Not only that the state can protect us, but um, yeah, of course that's true. And you, you, know, you purchase a device that delivers the state right into your home and it can protect you. Julia? Um, the guy with bad guys. Yes. Like yes. Right. And the way you protect the good guys is by getting rid of the bad guys. And the ad does not go on to say, and so in the morning, dear, I'm going down to the police station to talk to those two men and see what made them do this and maybe have some reconciliation with them. No, the idea is – remember what we were saying about the uh, – me shooting the uh, assailant situation? If the idea is that the situation is resolved when you've captured the person causing the situation, this is an extreme case of hating the person instead of the evil. And it's what has led us into – Probably if we didn't have so many other crises that were so severe, I would say this is our most serious crisis in this country right now. It's been called a stunning moral crisis that we have two million people uh, in the criminal justice system, if not actually incarcerated. And this the system tends to perpetuate itself. I know I'm in correspondence with uh, an inmate right now who was eligible for parole 
about six years ago, and he's an absolutely model prisoner. He should never have actually been convicted in the first place, but he, he's been before the parole board around six times, and every time he's been there they said, oh yeah, you've got a terrific case, and then they did not parole him. And the reason is that you have a prison guards union, and they quote, quote from a friend of mine, they want more prisons and more prisoners in them. And it just is, you know, it's for their own financial benefit to do that. So we used to have a professor here who was arguing, she was in the geography department, and she was arguing very passionately that never mind the getting rid of the death penalty, let's just get rid of the whole prison system. And really we would be much better off not arresting anybody. Uh, there would actually be less crime in the long run. This argument is not as absurd as it sounds because we know that people who are arrested and put in prison, it gives them the notion deep in their mind that they are criminals and they just spend their time in jail learning how to be more efficient criminals, just learning how to do it better. So when you really look at the numbers, this argument is not as absurd as it sounds, but it raises for us, uh, I think, a very interesting big picture question. Uh, Gandhi was very radical in some ways and he was willing to lay the ax to the root of a lot of deeply invested social institutions that people cared about a lot. But the Gandhi that we meet up with in, in Swaraj in 1909, when he was giving shock therapy to these Indians who were absolutely hypnotized by the glitter of Western civilization, and he was saying, you know, scratch, scotch the whole thing. No doctors, no lawyers, no, no uh, railroads, none of that. He did mature later on and he, uh, he had an attitude towards institutions which I think we can learn a lot from. And that is you looked at every institution on its own terms, not ideologically. And you did not say, for example, all authority is wrong. You said there is an appropriate use of authority and an inappropriate use. And you look at every institution and you ask yourself, can this institution be reformed? Can it be uh, trimmed down and pruned? Or is it absolutely hopeless and does it have to be chucked out? And the reason that this is a very efficient approach is that most institutions that we have, we have for a reason. They're there to do something. When we get rid of them, what is going to replace them? Well, what's going to replace them is often going to simply reproduce the problems that the original institution eventually degenerated into. And th th we've seen this over and over again in every uh, large-scale revolution. So um, there was a document that uh, turned out to be a forgery, but it was an interesting forgery <laughs> back in the early 70s called a report from Iron Mountain, which pretended to be a report of a presidential commission on the uses of the war system. And it actually it was by someone who didn't like the war system. But what he said was absolutely true. But the fact is right now we're using the war system for several different purposes. One of them is our economy requires about a 15 percent wastage of our domestic product or it won't work. You remember this is one of the reasons I walked out of my one and only economy course many years ago. Uh, and if we get rid of the war system, how are we going to fulfill these functions? So what that says to me is that before you knock a person off their perch, to use that expression, you know, before you knock a support out from under them, you want to A, build the next perch for them to get over onto and persuade as many people as possible to switch over to the new system before you dynamite the old system. 
And then secondly, look very carefully to what you can salvage, if anything, from the old system. This, this is the way Gandhi went about things. And one of the cases that we probably felt most uncomfortable with, and I'd like to talk about it a little bit right now before we get into criminal justice and so forth, is uh, the caste system. Um, first of all, anything we say about the caste system as he wanted it to function in India 50 or so years ago does not apply without changes to our culture. We are completely – we're on a completely different footing than they were. But what were the actual uses and benefits of the caste system? Uh, there's sort of two. One is nothing that you can ever do will prevent some people from being more aggressive and capable than other people. If you tried to level everybody off, you'd probably have to lobotomize everybody at birth. And what you would get is some kind of horrible uniformity, dehumanization instead of diversity. When you've got human diversity, some people are going to be smarter, more capable, more confident, and more aggressive. So if you just throw everybody out there in the market and say, let's see what you can do, the more aggressive, capable, and so forth people are going to claw their way to the top and pretty soon you're going to have that football field that I showed you a couple of weeks ago. So the caste system at least produces a kind of cushion or a hedge against unrestrained competition. And it does that in two ways. It gives people certain functions so that, you know, you might be very aggressive and capable at one thing, but it simply is not your role. You're going to do something else. Hang on just a second. And over the long haul, we have a tradition that's taken thousand or so years to build up as the caste system did. You bring in responsibilities along with privileges. Uh, pop me your question, Amos, and then I'll finish that thought. Well, I was just thinking, uh, isn't that sort of based on the assumption that uh, it's natural for humans to be aggressive and competitive in this way? But then if we bring in the caste system, we're going to want to claw to the top. That's saying that um, uh, I, I guess we're we're not quite saying that it's natural for human beings to be aggressive in the negative sense of the word, but rather it is natural for people to have different degrees of capability and different degrees of drive. And if you, if you just had a system where the person with the capability gets the banana or the a a carrot or whatever is at the end, what's going to happen to the people who have less capability and less drive? Now, you could so reorganize the culture that people wouldn't abuse their capacities and that's what we're calling trusteeship. Yeah, if you could bring in trusteeship in a major way, then you probably wouldn't need the caste system. Julia? Are you thinking of making it illegal to keep anybody in caste? Yeah. Okay. Ac actually, this is what Gandhi had to say about that. Uh, the Varna system, which is – Varna means color and it's the caste system – is ethical as well as economic. And this was an important feature of his economic system, by the way, that he felt if something was un unethical, it would be uneconomic. Okay? It's ethical as well as economic. It recognizes the influence of previous lives and of heredity. Because remember I was just telling you this isn't going to work in America. You're not going to go out to say to tell people, well, look who you were in your previous life. That's, that's why you have to be a professor or some other horrible fate. Uh, <laughs> next sentence, just a sec. All are not born with equal powers and similar tendencies. Neither the parents nor the state can measure the intelligence of each child. But there would be no difficulty if each child is prepared for the profession indicated by heredity, environment, 
and the influence of former lives. No time would be lost in fruitless experimentation. You know, you spend three quarters of your life discovering that you're terrible at something and then it's kind of too late to go back and start something else. There would be no soul-killing competition. And uh, hang on a second. Yeah. Th there are four varnas or castes, all equal in status and they are determined by birth. Hold on. Hold on, Julia. They can be changed by a person choosing another profession. Okay? They can be changed by a person choosing another profession. But if varnas are not as a rule determined by birth, they tend to lose all meaning. Okay? So his idea was that originally the caste system did not lock you into your, par your parents' profession. And he also had a very clever way out of this, uh, which was that no matter what caste you're born into, you can do whatever you want, but don't try to make a living at it unless it's your caste. So this allowed for people to experiment around with stuff. Let's say, you know, I really wanted to be, let's say, a writer. Let's take me, for example. I mean, it was a very interesting example. Uh, at one time, I was dead sure that I was wanted to write plays. I mean, really serious. Somewhere, something between Eugene O'Neill and Shakespeare. And <laughs> I experimented around with it. It was a classic example of experimenting around only to discover that A, I wasn't very good at it and B, I didn't really care about it. Uh, or maybe I decided not to care about it when I discovered I wasn't very good at it. Whatever it was, <laughs> I stopped telling people that I was going to write plays and set about uh, preparing myself for this highly lucrative profession that you see me in right now. But the point is, under Gandhi's scheme, if I really had an urge to do that, I could do that. But I should earn my living at something – most of the time I should earn my living at something within my varna. Shannon? I feel like there's a level of like institution there because mm -hmm. if you told me that like my past was being a lawyer, I would be like the worst lawyer. Like yeah. 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 See, there is a belief behind this. If you notice, he talks about rebirth and stuff. There is a belief that you, the 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 jiva, the person about to be born, kind of like matches up his or her, or maybe it's not determined yet, his slash her needs, sanskaras, capacities with a given set of parents to whom that match will make sense. So it's not likely that you'll be born into a family of warriors uh, and you really turn out to be Shannon McGuire <laughs> and that's the wrong place for you. So there is some belief there that it's, it's not entirely uh, – it's not a great danger that that's going to happen. And I'm saying you may, we may not believe that and that's okay. It's just the general principles that I want to get at here and not the uh, – not the particulars for us. And the general principle that I'm getting at to remind ourselves is what to do with institutions that aren't working, of which we have jillions. But let me just finish my thought about the difference between a traditional caste that's matured over thousands of years and just like a profession or a job or something like that. Or, you know, I was born into a mafioso family. So obviously I should be Joe Soprano or something. Um, there is a, a caste – not quite a caste, but a sub-caste, a distinction – a profession in Indian villages which are called Vaishya – sorry – Visha Vaishyas. Visha means poison and Vaishya means – sorry. Can't think straight when I'm in front of a blackboard. Visha Vaidya. Okay. Vaidya is from the word vidya, which means knowledge. You know, vaidya, as our word doctor, means a learned person, but it also means a doctor. 
So Vishavaidya is a doctor of poisons and a poison doctor. What that means is, you know, it, we have to realize it's not true in North America except certain parts of Texas and Oklahoma where they have sod winders. But <laughs> we are not infested with serpents in this continent. Not as well off as Ireland, which doesn't have any snakes at all. But in India, serpents, that is poisonous snakes, are a real problem. You know, you're, you know, you're coming home, crossing a field, and bang, something hits you in the ankle. You say, gee, what was that? Then you get home about ten minutes later. It's kind of swollen up and it's red. Then you start feeling woozy and you've been bitten by a cobra and you got like 15 minutes or something like that to, to live. And these things are very, very serious. And so what are you going to do? Well, every village has a Vishavaidya, the person who has this huge garden with hundreds of herbs. And he takes one look at you and he says, I know just what that was. That was a Krishnasarpa. It's a Sanskrit term for a cobra. It literally means a black, creepy crawly. <laughs> and, and this is what you need. You know, he goes and plucks this weed and prepares it and gives it to you. Now just imagine in that moment, if a person were to stop and say, what kind of health insurance do you have? <laughs> you know, or, you know those, those two cows that you've got that I've admired for such a long time? You, know, you, you see what I'm driving at. You have the power uh, to ruin a person. You have the power of life and death and the power to exploit to the end um, in this situation. So it, it happens to be the case that these Vishav ideas have a um, uh, what should we call it? A value, a norm. I'm forgetting the exact term here. They simply never charge money. They never charge any fees whatsoever. So the, the whole system, you see, has to come into balance where the the village takes care of them, and they take care of these people when they've been bitten. Now just imagine if I were to like, you know, take some kind of pharmacology course and learn something about snake poisons and set up shop in some little village in Kerala, but I haven't got this, this value that I've inherited from my parents that I'm not going to ever earn money and the, the village isn't taking care of me. So I would be in that dangerous situation. So if you just wipe out the whole institution, and then let the most aggressive people come into it who want to make a killing at it, um, you will end up much worse off than you began. So I'm, I'm sp spending a fair amount of time on this point because it's not one that comes naturally to us. We see an institution that's absolutely rotten and we say to ourselves, let's, let's ditch it. On and this has happened over and over again. Only to realize that the substitute has to come in because it did have a legitimate function and the substitute will be less efficient than the original. Yeah, Joy? Well, well, there, there is a problem with that logic. But remember, as I said, I wouldn't even suggest that we start uh, uh, applying this in our culture. We, we just don't have the infrastructure for it. And I'm not even arguing that the way that he did it in India was exactly correct. What he held out for was uh, – if the Varna system is a spiritual arrangement, there cannot be any place in it for high and low. And he went on to say, there are four Varnas, all equal in status. Okay, maybe it would be impossible to reach that. If you had Varnas at all, they would never equalize out into you. That also may be possible. But what I want to emphasize is that the simplistic reaction that we tend to have is, okay, unplug the system 
in the long run it does not work very well because then, then you get the football field where you have Bill Gates at one end and you and me at the other end and down we go. Oh yeah? Yeah, well, they could be. We're pushing it in the other direction. I've just been reading an, art an article about super rich people and about how among doctors, which used to be considered a very well-off profession, some doctors are waking up and realizing that they can go into uh, stock trading or medical legal stuff and they're getting super rich where other doctors are just staying doctors. And there's no way that you can do that from a shoemaker position. But if you brought in a certain dose of trusteeship, then I could easily imagine where doctors would feel very good about getting, you know, a comfortable compensation and no more, and like Vishovai does, and not exploiting their leverage to get inordinate amounts of money out of you. Uh, that there is incidentally – a social thinker by the name of Ivan Illich, who passed away a few years ago, who wrote a book called Medical Nemesis. Sorry about that name. I know that there is a novelette by Tolstoy with exactly that same title, The Death of Ivan Illich. And I don't know what his parents were thinking of when they actually named him that, but that's another question. But he started seeing, even before we went into this medical insurance legal thing, that the way we were using the medical profession, namely using it as a milk cow, as a source of income rather than as a way of preserving health, was rapidly becoming a disaster. And the, his predictions there were, were pretty right on. So it doesn't seem to me inconceivable that you could have a world in which People would be doctors and maybe even hereditary doctors and other people would be shoemakers. And they would be s e equal in dignity and roughly equal in compensation. It doesn't seem uh, that that could never be achieved. But anyway, I'm not arguing for it quite yet. Rami? His focus was definitely on the untouchables and on the destitute. And, you know, it's been pointed out that uh, the Christian Bible refers to poverty something a little bit more than 2,000 times. And it refers to homosexuality 12 times. And you have this, this group that says it's all about gay marriages and nothing about – like the head of the Christian coalition had to quit because he couldn't get the coalition to f even focus on poverty. Now, so you made two points. One is that, yes, uh, when you get to that bottom tier of needs, food, clothing, and shelter, the whole system is more or less responsible for making sure that everybody has enough of those. But the other point that you made, which is difficult for us to wrap our minds around, is that a person's dignity does not come from their profession. You know, we find it very difficult to have respect for a garbage collector. Because it's associated with refu refuse in our minds, the person <laughs> gets associated with the refuse, which is ridiculous. Which is why Gandhi spent most of his time cleaning latrines. <laughs> that, you know, the person – that this is an honorable profession. If he could get dignity into that profession, you could get it anywhere. Oh, yeah. 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 It, it wasn't easy. But at least there was some – there was a little bit of a cultural 
memory there that could be could be pulled into a play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, there are hundreds of experiments, now probably thousands of experiments going on. So I brought in the latest issue of Yes Magazine to show you where people are trying to do exactly that. They're trying to uncouple their wage earning from their spiritual development, their human relationships, and all of those other things. Just my general overview perspective on all of this is that every one of these experiments, you know, like local economies and there's the, there are many communities in the USA right now which are not using the federal currency and that turns out to be completely legal. I mean, I, I could go to the department's Xerox machine and print off scripts, you know, and trade it in for stuff. That turns out to be fine. There's barter economies. And uh, local agriculture growing up under the radar of these huge agribusiness things. My, my overview of them is that they d they're not aware of how important they are and what role, what precisely what role they're playing in the overall revolution. Let me read you a comment. I mean, why should we talk about what I was planning to talk about, right? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, third-party nonviolent intervention and criminal justice. And it doesn't look like we're quite going to get there. But this is uh, from a book by David Corton, who's connected with the Positive Futures Network that brings out the Yes Magazine. The book is called The Great Turning. And here's one paragraph that's relevant for us. Although the leadership styles of Earth communities so – he, he he says there are two tendencies going on in the world. One is empire, which is the domination system, and the other is earth community, which is the cooperation system. Although the leadership styles of earth community may seem chaotic and diffuse to those accustomed to the dominator styles of empire, where you have you know, the CEO and all the other stuff and they go all the way down to the janitor, they fit the pattern by which all healthy living systems self-organize. You know, you cannot go into the human body – and I, I know I spent a year in medical school looking into this. You cannot go into the human body and say, ah, here is the chief cell. And all the other cells have to obey this cell. It just doesn't organize that way. Um, it may – let's see. Oh. They fit the pattern by which all healthy living systems self-organize. This pattern of self-organizing distributed power gives contemporary social movements their distinctive vitality and makes them nearly impossible to suppress. So to appreciate what's being done by way of building an alternative economy, we'd have to get a new set of lenses and learn how to look at these different experiments. And then somebody would have to look at the whole picture and pull it into focus and do some strategic thinking with it. Okay, we have been a bit of all over the map. Would it be all right if I talk about the criminal justice system for, <laughs> for just a bit? Um, Let's, let's do quickly uh, kind of a, a quiz by way of getting into it. Let's see if we can think of an institution in each of these three categories, an institution that we've got in our world today. Uh, and it might not be very easy. But have we got an institution which is A-OK -okay and it, it doesn't need much reform? Maybe a little technical tweaking or something like that. B. Have we got institutions that need serious overhaul because they've become abusive? In other words, they need to be reformed. And C, are there any institutions that are hopeless and need to be totally gotten rid of? What would be your candidates for any one of those? In no particular order. Julia?
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then one that's like really bad though is the death penalty. Is what? The death penalty. Yeah. Well, the, the, the death penalty, that's a little bit smaller than what I was thinking of as an institution. That's, that's a practice within the criminal justice system. Um, anybody else have any candidates? These, these are helpful. I have librarians of the world who appreciate it. Camilla? I would almost put the media in the third one. You know, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. I've had this argument with, uh, with people like Norman Cousins and very – can it be redeemed? Theoretically, I think it could. You could have media that would be all like Sesame Street <laughs> and uh, would show nothing but movies like A Force More Powerful and things like that. But I'm one of those who thinks that the very fact of its artificiality and virtualness makes it so prone to exploitation that we might have to get rid of it. At least, let's put it this way, if we threaten to get totally rid of it, we might give it enough of a shock therapy that we could reform it enough that it would be worth keeping. Trilena? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, most people feel that the UN needs some, some serious reforming and they'll, you know, they'll lay that out pretty specifically. It was set up by uh, conquering triumphant nations <laughs> in 1945 who locked their own power in with this veto system. Um, you're probably aware of this, but there's a, there's a movement to reform the UN and one of the things that they want to do is let's take advantage of the fact that the nation state system is losing legitimacy and let's reorganize it by putting in one representative for every million people. And even Johan Galton, who is the first to admit that there'll only be four Norwegians <laughs> and there'll be 300 Americans, <laughs> that won't be much fun. He still thinks that's a better, better system. Represent people rather than representing nation states. So, but that's an interesting idea. I mean, I would have thought maybe something like motherhood, <laughs> an institution that we don't have to reform. But <laughs> Julia? Um, I think it's just basically got to go. I mean, it, you could argue that they, they make very good firefighters. Uh, but by the time you finished changing their entire training and all of their equipment, and the funding structure it would just be a different institution. Yeah. Yeah, Julian. Yeah. That I would be happy to see the plug pulled on, out of that and just see it float off. Yeah. Well, okay. And I think the point has been made that when we when we look at an institution, we should first decide how bad is it and what kind of rot does it have. And let me share with you briefly what people have been thinking about the criminal justice system. And from the nonviolent point of view, the conclusion is that it needs deep reform in the sense that the very energy that has brought that system into existence was the wrong kind of energy. And because you're intimately familiar with my book, you already know this. He smiled coyly. but. Uh, our whole system is what's now called retributive justice. And that's just a clear case of negative energy. And we know that Gandhi felt that in his ashram – I mean, parent and child relationship was a little bit different. But in his ashram, he felt that punishment was not uh, appropriate that you needed some other kind <coughs> of sanction other than punishing a person who had misbehaved. Mind you, he's not saying there's no such thing as misbehavior and he's not saying that one person is not responsible to do something about another person's misbehavior. This isn't like an anarchic system where anybody can do whatever they want. That simply does not work. 
But you needed to find a moral equivalent of punishment. And do you remember what it was that he found? Yeah. In other words, you take the suffering on yourself. And I don't know if I shared with you that story that Arun Gandhi tells of going – driving the 60 miles from the uh, – from Tolstoy Farm where he lived with his father who was Gandhi's son to Johannesburg one day. And to make a long story short, which is not a very Indian thing to do, he forgot to pick up his father at 5 o'clock and he was really, really scared. When he finally went to get him an hour and a half late, he said, oh, um, the car wasn't ready, which wasn't true. And his father had already called the garage, so he knew the car wasn't ready. So Arun thought he was in for it. Uh, and in a way, what happened to him was just worse than getting smacked around a little bit. His father said, I don't know where we went wrong as your parents that you felt you had to lie to us, but um, obviously the fault is mine, so I am going to walk home. It was 16 miles, he said, not 60. And he walked 16 miles with Arun driving three miles an hour behind him. <laughs> so, so this is a, this is a fairly extreme <laughs> example. I'm not saying that I necessarily recommend it. What I'm saying is what we now are trying to promote is restorative justice where you look upon the offender not as a criminal who has to be punished but as someone who has come somehow out of the social milieu and has to be brought back in. They have to be restored. And there are many experimental ways of doing this and even the legal profession is starting to find out that they're more efficient than locking people away in warehouses where they become more and more criminalized. Um, like I have another inmate friend who's been writing to me and he's so fed up with violence. He just wants to get out of it but he never will. He's going to die in there. And he, he says, I, go, I fall asleep at night with dudes talking about violence and I wake up in the morning surrounded by dudes talking about violence and it just does nobody any good at all to do this to people. So in restorative justice, what we try to do is – first of all, we do not start with the assumption that the person is unredeemable. That's never done. And second of all, we do not accept the assumption that the state or the society owns the crime, whatever it was. But rather, this is a matter between the offender and the victim. And so one of the programs, for example, that does this is called VORP, which is short for Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. And what they do is, as, it might, as you might think, they bring the victim and the offender together to talk about some form of restitution among themselves with the state being there only as a facilitator and a mediator. And then there are other experiments that go even further than this and many times we're finding that this is the way indigenous societies have survived for a long, long time. I, I've heard and I haven't been able to track this down. Maybe you can help me with this one, Seishi, that there is a system in some sub-Saharan communities such that if a person has offended in some way, the person is made to sit down. And the entire community sits around that person in a circle and they go around the circle and everybody has to – has to do what? Everybody has to say something good about that person. Isn't that amazing? It's the last thing you would have thought of. Obviously, you want to throw rotten eggs at them or something like that. Show them that they were bad. Well, of course, the problem is if you show them that they were bad, it tends to reinforce their badness and they get worse. So how well does this thing work? Well, as far as I've been able to hear, usually you only have to go around – halfway around the circle and the person typically breaks down and, and weeps and then they talk about what he – it's usually a he – what he should give back 
in order to make amends. And there are versions of this that are practiced um, in New Zealand, which is not a nonviolent society by any means. I'm talking about indigenous New Zealand societies and um, many other parts of the world. So, gosh, I wish we had a little bit more time to get into this, but there are experiments in industrial societies. They have got nowhere near completely revamping the system. Uh, unfortunately, when you talk about looking at the big the, at the system that's in place, what you find <coughs> is what just happened here in California. And I'll close with this. You had this young woman uh, who was a warden in uh, San Quentin. She was a remarkable human being. She tried to know every single prisoner personally. She would talk to them and say, how are we going to get you out of there? How's your kid doing? Things like this. The, what the prisoners said about her was fantastic. And I've been in every house in this state and I've never met anyone like Joanna. Well, our governor, for all you might say about him and his funny background, uh, he spotted the, this woman and made her the head of corrections in California. That's the good part of the story. The bad part of the story is she resigned about uh, two months later because she absolutely could not get anywhere. So we're faced with this dilemma where the big systems that are in place are practically impenetrable and I think it's mainly a question of building the other stool, showing them that another system can work and then we'll get enough <coughs> of a shift to happen. Okay, I feel on the one hand very happy, on the other hand very frustrated. There's a lot of stuff we didn't get to talk about. But I'm going to turn it over to you next week and just do review. And uh, if there's time to do some new stuff, I will. Thanks. Thanks.